Well, good morning again. Glad to be here. After missing last week ill, I was here, but thank you, Ray, for filling in. Um, and we get to continue our study in the book of Luke as we are going through this gospel. Let me read to us Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 51. When the days grew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans, and to prepare, make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Today, as we're continuing on our series, have we analyzed the life and ministry of Jesus? And now, a lot of focus these last couple chapters on his disciples. We see the story of Jesus traveling from the region he was at in Galilee down to Jerusalem. He comes across this town of Samaria that doesn't receive them, and then we're going to see as he goes through and con continues this call to make others follow him or call disciples, he continues calling people, follow me, and then we see this interaction um, along the way. So before we get into this, let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that this is a true historical, proven infinitely account of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the life and times. We believe this wholeheartedly, Father. We know that Jesus walked this earth performed great miracles to attest to the power of God, taught many things, but ultimately, Lord, as we saw from 1 Peter, he died and rose again, and this is our hope and our salvation. We thank you for that gift. I pray, Father God, that your word would penetrate the hearts of those here, that your Holy Spirit will, free, will freely move here, Father God, to free consciences, not to bind them, Lord God, to arrest them with the love of God, the desire to follow you. You know me pray. Amen. So this first section, let me reread the first paragraph here, and we'll get into this, starting in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So regionally, here's Galilee up here. They're heading south to Jerusalem. Jesus' face is set towards Jerusalem. And if you looked on a map of this time, right in between is this region called Samaria, Samaritan. That's where the Samaritans come from. Most Jews would have skirted around it. If you know anything about them, they are not great friends here, so they would have gone around it. And here Jesus is traveling with a large entourage, for lack of a better term, a big group. We see this time and time again. There's a lot of people around. Yes, there's the 12. Yes, there's the three, the inner core. But there's a group of people that are traveling. There's more disciples than just the 12. And so he sends people ahead, literally, to say, can we have a place to stay? Can we get some food? This is a large group. We don't want to just roll up last minute. So he's trying to get food and shelter for the night, but it says the town does not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem, right? And what that means is, not because he was heading south, but because he was Jewish, and these were Samaritans. And they were mortal enemies. You do not need to look far for this kind of example. It's basically like the Jews and the Palestinians today. They did not get along. In fact, they pretty much hated each other. This comes from the split of the northern kingdom of Israel back about 722, 721 B.C. 
So they had the nation of Israel was split and torn apart and many fled south, but some Jews stayed up in this region and they were taken over by the Assyrians. And as they intermarried and intermingled and time went by, they kind of became this quasi-Jewish, quasi-Gentile group of people that was called the Samaritans. They had some similarities. They all believed in the Torah, the first, what we would call the first five books of the Bible here. Um, they, they shared some beliefs and some ancestries, but then rejected others. And they just kind of adopted these different belief systems, kind of, again, semi-related, but, but not really. And so it says he was, had his face set towards Jerusalem. And this is notable because the woman at the well in John 4, when, when Jesus approaches her and asks for a drink of water, what does she say? Like, you're asking me? I'm a Samaritan. Like, we don't have anything to do with each other. And then she even clarifies that your people say that you worship in Jerusalem, but we say you worship on this mountain, right? So, so this is the disconnect we have between us. And so this village rejects him because his face was set towards Jerusalem, because they believed Jerusalem was their holy place, not this mountain, because they were a different sect, a different religion. They were not showing their hospitality. And by the way, this is understandable. I think we can all relate to someone not wanting to show hospitality as someone um, that they consider an enemy. And again, this is why when Jesus gives a parable about how we are to love our neighbor, he uses a Samaritan as the protagonist, right? A priest goes by, one of your own leaders, a Levite, one of the chosen tribes to help you. No, 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 they ignore you. But your neighbor is this Samaritan who has compassion. And so this village rejects Jesus and his disciples and his group. Reject the opportunity to serve and meet the Messiah, to be honest. Remember, Jesus was not an unknown character in this time. Everyone, his fame had spread far and wide. And so let's see how these disciples respond. These disciples, if you've been here for the last several years, probably a couple of months, you've seen a lot of ups and downs. These disciples have been on a bit of an emotional roller coaster, have they not? They were empowered and sent out with the, christened as apostles with the power to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to even raise the dead. Like, they, they are good. And, and what were they told to do when a town and a village rejected them? They were told to shake the dust off their feet and move on, right? Go gently, go peaceably. Where you're not received, move on. Okay, and, and then, so they have that power in this experience where they go out with the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we see them very recently, last week, now arguing about who's the greatest among us. Oh, I'm greater than him. And then, hey, this other guy is casting out demons in your name. Can you stop him, Jesus? Like, we want all the glory and credit. So these guys are like all over the place here. And here they are. Here they are, very fresh off the these examples that we just saw last week. They are sent to get these the provisions in this town and they are rejected and, and what's their response? Does this seem reasonable to you? Do you want us to call down fire and consume them? Say the word. You say the word right now, Jesus. I will snap my fingers and I will burn them up like Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the example that these guys are having. These James and John, they're called out publicly. They're thrown under the bus here for, for all to see forever. Maybe this is why they are called the sons of thunder, but they are livid. They are indignant. They want to literally burn this city to the ground because they could not get a meal and a place to stay. Keep this in mind next time you think you're an emotional wreck or a little bit spiritually unstable. Sometimes we ride these roller coasters of emotion in our spiritual lives. Sometimes we are arms up, eyes closed, praising God and feeling the spirit move. And sometimes we are barely getting out of bed we are doubting, man, am I even a Christian? It tells us Jesus rebukes them. I want to add a little bit here. It says Jesus rebukes them, and, and there's some manuscripts that add a little bit of a clause to this rebuke. Now, this is an asterisk, right? There's, there's a per parenthesis in most of our versions of whatever uh, Bible we have in translation, the way manuscripts are written, like it was written once and then copied and copied. There's no internet. No one's posting this on a blog. There's no even printing press. So someone would get a copy and write a copy out and then pass around and they'd copy it 10 times and so on, right? And so some of these really early, early manuscripts, 
They all validate each other, but some have this clause and some don't. So we're not calling it scripture, but it's very much in line with what we know scripturally. So this clause that, that is, exists in some of these oldest manuscripts, verse 55, it would say, but he turned and rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy lives, but to save them. These disciples, James and John in particular, but I bet others were feeling this, wanted to destroy an entire village because they were rejected, because their pride was hurt. And Jesus rebukes them with this concept that, I have not come to destroy lives, but to save lives. This tracks with everything we know about Jesus. Kind of what the apostles have written throughout the entirety of the New Testament for us. But what does Jesus, what does Jesus specifically teach on this issue? This issue, your feelings are hurt, you were rejected because they wouldn't feed you? What does he teach? Hey, take the plank out of your own eye before you worry about the splinter in someone else's eye. When someone offends you, turn the other cheek. When they argue, how many times should I forgive my brother? What does he say? Seven? No, seven times 70. Right? And he preaches over and over, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble. But woe to the proud, woe to the haughty. Jesus teaches repeatedly, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. And he teaches this so much, I think, because it's really not natural to us. It's not natural to me as I look at the news headlines like you do. We see how evil this world is getting. And our natural desire is not to make peace with this, but probably some level of vanquishing of our enemies, those the enemies of God, even a righteous anger. But the Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. He did not come to be served, but to serve as he demonstrates time and time again. And like everything else Jesus teaches, this is about the heart. This is about the heart. It's not about whether they had a place to sleep, or whether they had a good hot meal. It's not about what you do with your actions or your words. It's about your heart. In the heart of these Samaritans, they reject Messiah, right? Here's what we say. They, they are in the state of rejection, and they continue to reject the Messiah right in front of them because he's from a different clan that they do not like. But are they any worse off than these disciples at this moment in their hearts who want to rain down fire and brimstone on this clan that they don't like? Both are wrong spirits. This is why Jesus rebukes them. And led to their final end, both can be mortally detrimental to your eternal salvation. Here's what we see about these Samaritans. Let me read to you John 3, 17 and 18. Everyone knows John 3, 16, but let's look at this, the state of these Samaritans right now. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. These Samaritans in their village are actively, before Jesus came along, in a state of rejection of the Messiah, of God. By the way, that's where we all start. That is the starting point of humanity. If not from your own sin, from your father's sin, and just trace that all the way back to our great father Adam, we are in the sin, the state of sin. We are deserving of hell based on our own sin and the sin of our ancestors. This is where these Samaritans are right now. And they are presented with a chance to recognize and accept and serve the Messiah. And they choose to reject him out of, out of their own pride. I don't think we can see that too many other ways. Not unlike many today. And this is the point of the gospel that we see over and over and over again. On that final day of judgment when men, men and women are cast into the lake of fire to suffer eternal damnation. By the way, this is not hyperbole. This is a fact that we believe. There will be a judgment day. There will be a day of judgment, right? And that day of judgment will come harsh for those evil warmongers and Hitler and all the big bad guys you want to say, but you know what? It's going to come harsh for your neighbor or someone even in your family who still rejects the name of Jesus Christ. 
Many want to feel indignant out of that fact. How can a loving God send, send such nice people to hell? But the reality is, how can a just and righteous God allow anyone into heaven? This is the reality we are faced with. This is why Peter and Paul and all the New Testament writers, they don't preach a gospel of Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you is not the gospel message. The gospel message is what? You are a sinner in need of a savior. And Jesus loves the world so much that he sent his son to die for sinners, such as yourself, such as myself. Therefore, repent of your sin, turn to him, acknowledge him as Lord of your life, and be forgiven of your sin. And that is how you will be welcomed into heaven at the day of judgment. Jesus loves you is a false gospel to dying people. But Jesus loves you is the most beautiful truth in the world to those who have called in the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. To the lost, they are condemned already. These Samaritans are already in the state of rejection of the Messiah, but they were still called. They were given this opportunity to be in the presence of the Messiah, and they refused out of the hardness of their hearts. But even to those who do hear this call, those of us who heed the call, there's a stark warning as we're going to see in this second the second paragraph, let me continue on in verse 57. But they were going along the road. Someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as far as you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow will look back and looks back as fit for the kingdom of God. What do we see in this paragraph? What are we looking at here? I think we're seeing that the call to follow Jesus is hard. We see this with the interaction with the Samaritans. See this picture right now that Jesus left, Samar left this region, the Samaritan village. And he continues down this road. I don't know whatever vision you need, like traveling between villages and farmland and vineyards in between and having interactions along the way. Maybe as he stopped at a village or a well, I don't know. But, but this is the picture we have. He's literally continuing on his journey. And he's interacting and has these, these three prototypes these three prototypes of calls to discipleship that, he's, that we see in the Gospel of Luke for our benefit to learn. So I'm going to look at these three different clauses that we see there, but I'm going to frame this through the parable we see in Matthew 22. Okay, so I'm going to talk through this parable of Matthew 22, and then we'll look and examine these clauses. Matthew 22, we have this parable of this king. By the way, we know parables are given for various reasons, to tell a teaching example that Jesus gives, and sometimes it's to confuse people as he tells his disciples. Sometimes it's so they may not know. But this one's pretty easy to understand. This one's pretty easy to understand. So track along who the king is, who the son is, who the invited guests are. So there's this king who's having a wedding feast for his son, and he sent out his servants to call those who had been invited. Those invited guests of this feast, he calls them, hey, come out. Come out. To the, it's the day. Let's go. Where are you? No one is showing up. No one is here to celebrate. And so he sends his messengers out to invite these people and bring them in. And these messengers are rejected. They're pushed aside. The invited guests aren't coming. And so the king sends out more messengers. Prophets. This king sends out more messengers out there. Okay? And it says they are rejected. They are despised. They are even murdered. Okay? And so the king's not having it. And so the king sends out his messengers. He deals with those people and he sends out his messengers and he says, hey, you go out to the highways, the byways, you spread this invitation far and wide, you tell everyone who can come to come. And so that's what this messenger does. He sends people out and, and people respond. People come. People heed the invitation, the great king to come to the, the celebration of his son, the most special occasion for his son and his, for his family. And then the king sees a man who is dressed inappropriately. It says he's not wearing a wedding, proper wedding attire. So he comes dressed like a slob. And the implication there is he's not there to honor the king. He's not there with a the right heart. He's there for the free meal. And the king says to him, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the king 
cast him to the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then that parable in Matthew 22 ends with this phrase, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. So we're going to look at this. Now take this concept. Remember this parable right here as we go through this next section. Right? Many hear the call to follow Jesus. Most notably, the rich young ruler. They hear the call. They have this invitation to follow Jesus. And they might even desire it. But something holds them back. They do not heed the call. They hear it, but do not obey. This parable of the wedding feast shows us that first you must be invited... And then you have to come, but but you have to come with the right posture. And before anyone gets any sketchy here, we're not talking a works-based righteousness or gospel. That right posture is not clean up your life and make yourself worthy of God. There is nothing you can do to make yourself worthy of God. He does it all. The blood of Jesus Christ does it all. The only thing we bring to the equation of our salvation is our sin. It's not turn your life around. That's not the right posture of coming to Jesus. The right posture, as we see scripturally over and over and over, is humbly, completely submitting to God for all things. When you follow Jesus, you do it with your entire being. As we've seen recently, you deny yourself. You deny your vision of what a good life looks like, what you think is best for you. Even as we read in our proverb, we lean completely on God. We pick up our cross, literally that picture of Jesus on the road to Calvary, picking up his cross, marching to his death. We do that as well with our Savior. We say, this world is not my home. This life is not my own. We deny ourselves, we pick up our cross, and we follow Jesus completely. That's the right posture. Not, as I've heard, maybe you've heard, I've actually talked to people who treat treat the gospel message like fire insurance. Like, well, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'll say some magic words if that'll get me into heaven. If it's true, great, I go to heaven. If it's not, well, there's no really harm, no foul, right? That's not the right posture. It's not walking down an aisle, raising your hand, or saying a magic prayer. It is, is your heart converted? Are you truly following Jesus Christ? Many are called like the parable of the sower. Parable of the sower, he scatters a lot of seeds, and we have a lot of examples of those seeds which do not bear fruit. So Jesus here is teaching us on what this disciples looks like. This point three in your bulletin. We see this first guy. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The point here is count the cost. Count the cost of following Jesus. When Jesus is saying, I have nowhere to call my home, he's not rebuking this man. He's not rejecting. We know sometimes Jesus reads the hearts and minds of someone who's making a point or pushing back. I don't know that that's the case here. But this is a, this is a, stark, a stark warning. Count the cost. You, it's not all butterflies and roses to follow Jesus. You're signing up for a life of, what, homelessness? Don't make the claim lightly because it is not an easy road. If you truly follow Jesus, if you truly submit to the will of God, then there's nothing in your life that you keep separate from him. You don't have this beautiful little existence over here. Hey, I get to golf on Fridays. I got my good job. I'm working on my career. We got, you know, golf night, wine night, whatever it is. And then I go to church on Sunday mornings. That's not a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple of Jesus Christ says, oh, no. It invades every fiber of my being. This is who I am. Everything else is secondary to that. I'm a Christian who has a job over here. I'm a Christian who coaches Little League. It pervades every aspect of your life. And this this example of there's no, the Son of Man has no home to call his own, no place to lay his head. Your vision of your life, and by the way, we all share a very similar vision for the most part. We want to have a home want to have security, want to have a little bit of money in the bank, be able to pay the bills. These are good things. These are God-honoring things. I'm not diminishing them. But they're not our hope. We're not promised that. We're promised to follow God where he leads. The stark warning here, I think, is don't say that you are a follower of Christ. Don't claim the name of Christian if those words are not all-encompassing to you. Because this road is hard. 
This call to follow is hard. You are not promised good things. Jesus does not say, follow me and reap the rewards. Follow me and get clout and status and fame and comfort and adoration of the masses. He's not saying, follow me and all your problems will go away. Your marriage will be fixed. You'll learn how to pay your bills and live financially prudently. That's not the gospel message. He's saying, follow me, but know that it's a hard road. Because when you are in the world, but not of the world, the world will hate you. And you will be an enemy of the world. The world does not deal kindly with its enemies. So the second one, point number four, everything else is secondary to following Jesus. Verse 59, and he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury the dead. So this man says, Lord, let me go follow, let me go bury my father. I don't think, I'm confident, his dad didn't just die two days ago and is laying there embalmed, waiting to get put in the ground, and we're talking two days. What he means is, in honoring my father and mother, they are still alive. Let me fill out my service as a son to them in their old age, in their retirement years. Let me keep working around the house. And when they have passed on, then I will follow you. This is the concept that we have here. It could be, it could be that this man has noble intentions, and likely is, right? Like, it is good to honor my father and mother. That doesn't end when you turn 18, kids. That's, that's a continual, continual exhortation. Father, honor your father and mother. And so he says, maybe honorably, like, I'm obeying scripture. I am honoring my father and mother. But Jesus is saying, the greatest ultimate honor is to follow me. The greatest and ultimate call is to honor and follow God. Everything else is subservient to that. Modern, modern technology or modernize this like this. Jesus says, follow me. And what this guy is saying is, I would, but I've got family obligations. I've got kids I gotta get through college. Man, our baseball schedule is super busy right now. I mean, my parents are not doing great. They got medical. I got a lot of things I gotta get squared away. My 401k, if I just put in five more hard years of overtime, God, then I can follow you. This is the example of what we're seeing here. Let me get all my ducks in a row, and then, then I'll be ready to follow you. This is what we're seeing. It's almost like young people who are trying to have kids are like, you know, I'm just waiting if I can just uh, have enough money in the bank, if I could just buy a house first. And like, they just delay and delay and delay. This is what we see here. And Jesus says, no, leave everything and follow me. And follow me for what end? To proclaim the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, we live in a society ordered by God. Everything is ordered by God. Our family unit is designed and ordered by God. Our church designed and ordered by God. Even local governments, good, bad, and corrupt, are ordered by God. God is not saying reject the order that he has established. He is saying don't improperly prioritize these things over him. Our first and primary responsibility is to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Proudly and boldly. Everything else is secondary to that. You following God completely is your most important job. You loving your wife or submitting to your husband or raising your kids and loving and supporting them is secondary. Do you see that? Everything. Parents, the hard truth is this. And I don't want to wrinkle any feathers here. Your job is not to love and support your kids. Do you see that? Just open the Bible and tell me where you see love and support your kids. By the way, I love and support my kids. That is good. That is a natural byproduct of a heart that honors God and is doing the right thing. But that gets twisted. That gets twisted to now, my kid's feelings are hurt. Therefore, I'm going to go yell at his coach, and I want to make sure he gets a participation trophy. I want to validate all their wants and everything. It used to be when I was a kid, I'm old, I was talking to someone this morning. He's like, I was born in 93. I'm like, I graduated high school in 92. Right? But when I was a kid, it was kind of understood. When my dad, and this happens, gets a call from the school saying, yeah, you need to come pick up your son. He's suspended again. Right? Don't, doing some stupid stuff. He didn't go down there and march and yell at the school and say, well, these rules are stupid. He's a good kid. You don't know what you're talking about. No, 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 no. There's steam coming out of his ears. And that anger was directed at me. Okay, in fact, I remember one summer, 
one summer, I don't know if you'll remember this, I remember one summer, I got a 3.0 grade average. And because I did so poorly in school, I was on restriction all summer long. My brother and I both, we painted that patio cover, we mowed the lawns, we didn't hang out with friends because I was a bad student. Do you see the whore that I was raised in? <laughs> we need to prioritize. We need to have an utter and complete faithfulness to Jesus Christ. This is how we truly honor our parents. This is how we truly love and train up our children. This is what it means to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't mean validate your neighbor and don't challenge them in their sin ever. That's not loving. A good parent knows that's not loving. The best way we train up our kids to honor God is, like as I talk to parents of teenagers right now, you can't change their hearts. Only God can do that. What's my phrase, Isaac? I can spank their butt and send a message north, right? And that's what I hope. But we can't change their hearts. But what we can do is we can model godly living for our kids. And we can show them, I honor Christ more than anything else. I love God more than I love you. Yes, that's harsh, but that's true. And if that's not true, you need to honestly self-evaluate. There is to be no other gods before God. That is our ultimate love. Kids, Parents, hopefully your parents, your kids, hopefully your parents can say this. They love you more than anything in this world. I promise every one of your parents would starve to death and give you their last meal. Every one of their kids your, of your parents would die in traffic to save you. Without a question, without a doubt, instantly, with no remorse. But they love God more than they love you. What, would you, what do we parents want for our kids? If you have a list of material things, we want them to have a good, a good job and a good career, maybe get an education, marry good, marry well, godly person, have, give me grandkids. Those are all good things. But you know what the ultimate want for a parent should be? I want my kids to follow Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. This is our heart. This is what we should be like. This is the point of this man saying, I'm going to get my ducks in a row first. No, follow God first. Everything else is secondary to that. And our last point, starting in verse 61, yet another said, I will look, another said, I follow you. I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. All right, admit it. That's a little bit of an odd response, right? No one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This man, he's not saying, I'm going to go live out my life and wait for my parents to die of natural causes, and then I'll follow you. He literally just says, I want to go say goodbye to those at home. That seems like a reasonable request, does it not? Well, actually it is, I think. I think we're going to cross-reference this with 1 Kings, and we'll see that it is. This is exactly what happened between the prophet Elisha and Elijah. The future prophet Elisha, I should say at this time. First Kings 19. Okay, as we're looking at this answer of let me go, let me go say farewell, and then no one who puts his hand to the plow. First Kings 19, starting in verse 19. So we departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. That's not a fat joke. Who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, plowing with twelve yokes of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? Elijah's like, yeah, that makes sense. You don't know me. And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So Elisha was plowing his field. He's a farmer. His job is to care for these fields, provide food, raise food, sell it, trade for whatever, right? So this is his career. This is his livelihood. And he's doing this good work. And Elijah throws his cloak at him. Again, probably doesn't translate super well. At the time, I guess he knew what it meant. We might think it's kind of odd. But Elijah throws his cloak at him and he says, okay, I'll follow you, but let me just go say farewell to those in my house. Let me go kiss my mother and father goodbye. And Elijah says, yes, of course, that's reasonable. Go, go do that. The request is fine. The request is not the problem. But I think the meaning behind Jesus' response 
is what we see in the actions of Elisha. After he does that, he takes the oxen and sacrificed them and boiled them, and they ate it. And he arose and went and followed Elijah. Elisha is not going to finish plowing that field. He takes the animals that he was using for his earthly work, and he sacrifices them to God, and then he leaves everything and follows Elijah. He cuts his ties completely. This is what we see. He completely turns his back on his old life to follow Elijah here. He's not going to plow those fields with those dead oxen, and no one's going to come after him without bringing their own oxen. He's all in. He does not leave an opportunity to return to his former life. This is the response, I think, that we see in this picture. It's kind of like that phrase, burning a bridge. You know this phrase. But picture like before airplanes and and sophisticated aircraft carriers or, uh, you know, boats or whatever. Like if some army is taking a land, going across the land and they cross a large river on a bridge and they get to the other side, that general burns that bridge. He burns the bridge so he's telling his army, we're not going back. You are either going to continue and succeed and be victorious in conquering this land or you are going to die here. Retreat is not an option. There is no going back to your former life. That is what we see when we see the phrase burning a bridge. I think this is what we're talking about. By the way, the same applies when you quit a job really, really poorly. So don't do that. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Once you cross that Rubicon, you're all in. You're all in. Once your eyes have been opened, if you need to picture this as a matrix reference, go for it. Once you have seen the light of Jesus Christ, there's no going back. You don't follow Christ and then talk with your buddies. Oh man, those are some good old days, weren't they? Do you remember that one time? Ah, I guess I guess those days are gone. That's not the picture we have as a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, isn't this what happened to Lot's wife? As she's saved from the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah, as it's literally being destroyed, and she looks back, and the sin is looking back wistfully, like, oh, good memories. Put away every shred of your old life and follow him. I think we all understand conceptually what I'm saying, but how do we live that? What does that look like practically? Right? And we're not telling you. Certainly not suggesting you burn your car and your computer and your work tools and do anything else and live this life as a monk roaming about like David Carradine and Kung Fu just looking to do good things and and see wherever the spirit leads. That's not what we're talking about here. Again, we're talking about the heart in every matter. We're not talking about shunning your family and your kids in search of a holy purity. But we see glimpses of that in here. We know scripturally that we are called to do many things. We're called to honor your father and mother. We're called to train up our children in the way they should go. We know we're called to work hard, to be good stewards, to provide for our family. In fact, it's an elder qualification or deacon qualification. If a man doesn't manage his household well, how can he manage the household of God? Right? We're called even to make money and pursue success career. We see this in the Proverbs 31 woman who does, you know, makes things and sells them and invests in the field. These are all good things. Be good steward. The parable of the talents. I'm not saying don't pursue or don't fulfill your worldly obligations, but that wherever God has called you to be, that you see everything in your life supports that end. Your chief end in life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It is to share the good news, as we see here in this one example, to proclaim the kingdom of God. Your chief end in life is not material or emotional or financial success and happiness and self-worth and the adoration of your neighbors and a good reputation. That doesn't have any bearing on what you are called to do as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You don't exist to get a college degree and own a home and then serve God. You exist to serve God and everything else is prioritized below those facts. God doesn't want your Sunday mornings. He doesn't want your tithe. He wants your all. He wants your heart. 
It's important that you realize that God does not care if you're rich or you're poor. He cares that everything you have is for his good. Your time, talent, and treasure. Luke 21, we see this example. Verse 1, Jesus looked up and saw, a rich, saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in her two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. Again, it's not about what you do. It's not about what you give. It's about your heart. Are you sold out for Jesus Christ? What do you care most about? Do you care most about the pleasures of this world? Do you care most about your fun, your family, your fantasy football team? I don't know. Or do you care about following Jesus Christ with everything? This is the problem of Cain and Abel that we see very beginning of humanity. They both brought God their offering. Cain brought him the first fruits of his sheep. So Cain is a shepherd and says, these are the best that I have produced and I give them to you, God. And Abel says of his fruits and vegetables, here, God, here's some of mine. I mean, ignore the bruising. It was a bad year. We know which one that God honored and which one God rejected. But I want you to think this through. God doesn't eat sheep and God doesn't eat fruits and vegetables. It wouldn't have mattered one bit to God and taste-wise, whether he had the unblemished ones or the blemished ones. God needs to be the priority in your heart. This man right here is not chastised for saying goodbye to his parents. That's not the problem. You're not called to cut ties with your family and friends, but the point is you are called to hold everything in this life loosely. To see everything in this life apart from Jesus Christ as less valuable than being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is our chief end. Everything here just fills in the gaps. The ultimate point of this passage that Jesus is making is that following him is hard. Many are called, but few are chosen. The Samaritans heard the call and chose to reject him. Potentially, these, these potential disciples along the road Again, maybe not a direct chastisement to them, but examples. They hear, heard the call of Jesus. Many are called, but few actually truly follow the parable of the sower. Many seeds are scattered. Some don't take root at all. Some take a shallow root. Some grow up and are ch choked out by the cares of the world. And some grow up and bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Matthew 7, verse 13 reminds us this. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the easy, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Man, look around you at this world and its temptations, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. We are told to count the costs, and here's the cost. It's everything. It's an expensive cost to count. You're called to walk the narrow path and it's hard and very few who make it. You're called to sacrifice or be willing to sacrifice your friends, your family, your career, your finances, your reputation, even your life, even your life for the privilege of following Jesus Christ. This is a hard saying. This is hard. This is hard, but what truth I've learned recently is that everything's hard. You just choose your heart. Being overweight and out of shape and having heart conditions is hard, but Working out and eating healthy and denying myself is hard too. Being financially disciplined and making good decisions and denying my spending and really monitoring and making a budget, that's hard. But so is being broke and being in debt and having creditors called. It's all hard. It's all hard. Choose your hard. Choose the hard that leads to eternal life. Choose the hard path, the one that leads to everlasting communion with God. It's hard to follow Jesus completely and fully. But look at the world around you. Look at the misery we see all around us. These people wandering aimlessly, trying to find happiness in their success and in their wealth and their fame and their own pleasure. That's hard too. That's hard too. If this matters, as we say all the time, it matters more than anything. I believe that. I pray. I'm grateful that many do. Let's pray. Father God, you are a good and gracious God. You are worthy of all of our soul, all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength. 
I pray that you will give us courage of conviction to stand firm in these dark times. We'll be bold followers of Jesus Christ, knowing that there is nothing else worthy of our ultimate pursuit. Yes, God, we work. We are commanded to work. It's scriptural and God honoring to work and to raise our kids. And yes, even to take them to Little League and baseball and enjoy the pleasures and good measures of this life. But we are first and foremost followers of Jesus Christ. And that should consume every thought we have and every identity we have is subservient to that. Thank you, Lord God, for this call in our lives and for the strength that you give to heed that, Lord God. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You need me to pray. Amen.